Well, good morning, everybody. We'll uh, start in a few moments, but uh, yep, we're just waiting for a few more people to join us. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for everyone for coming to three weeks in a row, if you've uh, been to the other two as well. Yeah, it's just a few more people signing in as, uh, as it ticks over to 10 o'clock down there. And for those people in Auckland that are in lockdown, um, you're currently speaking to a couple of uh, guys in Melbourne that are obviously in lockdown and myself here up here in north of Sydney. We're also in lockdown, so we, we feel your pain. And hopefully next week uh, you'll be out of lockdown and uh, be able to, well, some way towards getting out of lockdown. <clears throat> Those on the South Island and elsewhere, I guess you're, uh, you're, you're enjoying newfound freedoms again. So, okay, well, uh, thank you all very much for joining us today on what is the third Arlong Computer Letter uh, lockdown learning session. Um, thank you uh, for, for those that have been with us for the first two sessions. Um, and if this is your first session, just a few housekeeping rules. Your microphone is muted automatically by, uh, by the system. But if you need to ask a question, if you move your mouse to the bottom of the screen, a little pop-up will come up. There's a chat bar there. Uh, there's the raise your hand and there's the Q&A. So you can type a question in Q&A or you can type a question in chat and we'll do our very best to answer those as we go along. This session is absolutely designed for your, you and to um, answer and deal with topics that are, that are troubling you or challenging you. So don't be afraid, chat away and we'll do our very best. So just to introduce myself, Neil Gomez, uh, Director of Sales for the ANZ region here in, uh, in for Arlong. Um, we have the main event, which is Callum, Callum James. Uh, I'll let Cal introduce himself shortly. And we have uh, James Smith also from Arlon as well. And we will also be able to uh, put you in contact with any of the computer letter people if you've got a question about uh, availability or, or, uh, or range or anything like that. So feel, feel free to ask any questions. And uh, without further ado, I'll let Cal hand over. To, I'll hand over to Cal. He's got three great, interesting topics for you today. And uh, let's hope that you enjoy the session. And uh, over to you, Cal. Thanks, Neil. Um, so welcome everyone, thank you um, for joining us. So I am Cal James, Technical Rep Specialist for Arlon Graphics, uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, you might notice if you were at the other two webinars, um, the background's looking a little different in this one. I am, I have moved out of the workshop and I'm now in, the, in my carport. So we are still in lockdown, I am still in lockdown, um, so I'm... Uh, We'll do, I'll do the best that I can from uh, being stuck at home, but I've moved out and I'm going to do a demo. Everything that we'll demo today will be on um, my, on this Toyota Yaris here that I've got pulled into my carport. So I've got it facing, I'm going to do the demos on the back bumper and on, on the back of the car, um, purely just because it's got a couple of nice curves here and the front bumper just isn't um, complex enough really to do, do the demo on. So well, the three topics we're going to cover today, we're going to cover um, joins, hiding joins with knifeless tape and hiding how to hide joins on highlights. Um, I love knifeless. And actually, I'm going to throw out a question to you guys. And, and if you've um, joined the other two meetings, you'll, you'll uh, be familiar with this. But just throw an answer in the chat box. You can either write a yes or a no. Do you guys, does everybody here use knifeless tape? Uh, and if you don't is it because is there a reason why do you not like it or do you not feel comfortable using it um because i've got a few tips um on how to sort of make it make life easier with knifeless tape i think it's one of the best inventions in the industry and i use it pretty much on everything i do great everyone's haven't seen a no yet everyone's positive about knifeless so i'm going to talk about hiding joins on highlights um i'm going to talk about double double layer inlays now that's um, the best name i could come up with it it's basically doing a patch or an inlay 
um, and then doing another layer on top to hide the join even more than just doing a regular overlap join. Um, some people may know what I'm talking about, others it may, may sound a bit confusing. I will, all will become clear when we get to that. And the third thing we're gonna do is a bit of basic um, templating. So I'm gonna template around the aerial that's on the roof of the, of the Yaris here. But the technique I'm gonna use for templating uh, translates to anything, any shape, um, handles, anything like that. But we'll just do it on, on the aerial, nice and simple shape. Okay, so I'm going to, so yeah, and, and as Neil mentioned, oh, you've just said it in the chat. So feel free to ask questions as we go, just throw them out in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, and when there's a break between um, topics or I've got to change the camera, we'll, we'll flick to a couple of questions and hopefully we can answer everything. So um, I'll just jump into it. Um, oh, and if you haven't joined the other two, I do recommend that you go back and watch the first one, uh, at least the start of the first one. That's got an intro on SLX Plus which is the film we're going to be using. And I do explain flight technology uh, and how the adhesive works. Um, but I won't repeat all that now. So we're just going to jump into it. So Cohen, if you can um, flick to the side camera here. So I'm just going to zoom in relatively tight on the top of the back bumper here. Now you can see that I am literally working out of the back of the car here. This is my now mobile <coughs> workbench. So I'll bring the light in. <clears throat> okay, so we can see this section here, okay. Now, I'm just gonna do a couple of little demos of knifeless on the top of the bumper here before I start putting on vinyl. So <clears throat> one of the main things that I hear about um, with knifeless tape is that people have trouble starting it. Um, it's a common sort of thing. People go, oh, I like knifeless, but I always, um, break it or I'm not quite sure how to start it properly. So I'll just do this, I'll do this a few times. The main thing that I would say to people is give yourself quite a bit of excess. So don't, if you're gonna put a piece of film on here, don't only give yourself 20, 30 mil at the side. Make sure that you leave at least 100 mil or more of knifeless tape. Um, so that you've got plenty to hold on to. That's the first tip. Um, the way that they tell you to start it in the instructions, so this is not my technique, is to put your thumb or fingertip on the edge of the knifeless, and hopefully that's coming through okay. And then give it a little tug to break the green tape, but not the string. Does that show up all right, Cohen? Hopefully that's in focus. So I'll switch to the handheld just so you can see what I'm talking about there. And then once you've done that, you then slowly, when you, once you get up to the film, you also want to put your fingertip on the, um, sorry, on the edge of the film to just hold that down and then pull the tape, pull the string. So now I'm going to show you another two little tricks that I really like to use. First one is not breaking the tape straight away. So using the roll, so I haven't snapped the tape. My film is here. And hold, hold the roll in your hand to do the, the tug to break the tape and then break it off the roll. There's something about it, <coughs> excuse me. There's something about it staying on the roll when you're holding it, that just gives it a bit more stability um, and makes it much easier to, to get that first break. The next thing I'm gonna show you, and this is something that we used to do back when I was working at Exotic, when we were rushed, not, not rushed, when we had big jobs, we would need to set up knifeless tape. Um, we might've had a junior working uh, or an apprentice, someone that wasn't confident with knifeless, so we'd help them by getting the knifeless set up for them because running knifeless on, body lines is quite a skill. So we would set up the knifeless and we would pre-break it or pre-start it for them. So I'll show you what that looks like. So put the film there, pre-break it, pre-start the line and then just set it like that. <clears throat> so 
the knifeless tape is already started, but I've stuck it back down to the panel. So it is basically just ready for the line to be pulled whenever the person's ready to, when they've finished applying the vinyl. So that can be a nice little, you know, there's nothing worse than wrapping something and then dreading having to go and pull the tape and worrying that you're gonna break it and thinking, oh, you know, I'm gonna to have to pull out the knife and do something fiddly to get it started. So just pre-breaking, pre-starting the knife list can be a nice little um, tip to help make things go smoothly. Has any, does anybody already do either of those things by, by breaking the tape with the roll in hand or pre-starting it? Okay, I'm gonna move on now to the actual join part of the knifeless bit. So I'm gonna drop this down slightly as, again. So this join, oh sorry, this body line here on the car, um, this particular rear bar is not crazy aggressive. You can see this curve here. You could wrap this in, um, but we'll imagine that this goes back even further. So if this flat panel went back another 50 or 100 mil, it would get into um, inlay territory. So I wouldn't necessarily want to wrap this in one go. I would want to put an inlay or a patch on this flat and wrap the bar separately. So if I was going to do that, <coughs> excuse me, I would need to hide a join somewhere. And the places that I look to hide joins is where I can already see a reflection in the light. So if I were to just put the, the patch anywhere, so let's say this bottom piece here is the, the whole rear bar. So I'll put some knifeless down actually. So if I just put that join in the middle of sort of nowhere, And I've just done what I've told you guys not to do, which is leave myself very little, very little knifeless. That's okay. Just to prove your point, Cal, well done. Good job. For years of experience of having to save tiny, tiny pieces of knifeless. So this, imagine this is the entire rear bar piece. And then I'm going to <clears throat> overlay the inner part of the bar. I don't know if that line, oh yeah, I can see that line here, but I'm gonna show you on the close-up camera as well. So whenever you do a join, whenever there's two layers of vinyl, there's two parts to the join. There's the overlap, the vinyl that goes on top, and there's the underlap, which is the vinyl underneath. And the underlap is almost always the most visible line. So that's the line that catches the reflection because it, the vinyl is doing a little step up or down, depending on the direction. So that line there is the one that always stands out. And that's the one that I always spot if it's, if it's not sort of hidden or done, done well, I would, I would say. So that is an example of where I wouldn't put the join. That's too high. So because that little step creates that reflection, I want to hide that or put that where there's already going to be a reflection on the car. So <clears throat> I'll go back out to the other camera and I'll give you a, just an example of that with a scrap piece here first. So yeah, you guys can see in the camera there where the reflection line is. And this is just a test piece. So I would do this, I always do this. I'll grab a scrap. <clears throat> I'm not necessarily knifelessing this piece. I'm just grabbing a, a test piece of film and I'm sort of putting it where I can see that line. And then I'll grab another off cut 
and put it over the top. And I'm not too worried about where the vinyl stops in this instance, because this is just to test the underlap, if you will. So now go back to the handheld. And the underlap is right there. But if you can see, it's right on the highlight anyway. So it minimizes its visibility. You don't, even though technically you can see it if you look for it, because you're expecting there to be a, a line there anyway, it's far less visible. So it's all about, it's basically tricking, tricking people or diverting attention away from something. Um, because if they don't know to look for it, they won't see it and um, you'll get a better, better end result and a happier customer. So that's the general theory of hiding, hiding a join on a highlight. And again, I'll just move that, that join up. <clears throat> so I picked up both pieces and moved them out of the way. And now you can really see that line. So does anybody <clears throat> already familiar with, with that? Are people already sort of looking out for body lines and stuff like that? That's one of the first things that I do when I'm, when I'm gonna wrap a bar that's complex. If it's, um, got crazy angles and I know that I can't get it in one piece, the first thing, or well, the next thing that I'm looking at is where are the body lines? Can I hide a join? Can I hide a patch or an inlay? Um, and generally the sharper the body line, the better. So when you get really curvy, smooth, um, complex shapes, it's very hard to hide joins. But if you get very sharp angular um, lines, it's almost makes it makes it really easy. So some people see a really complex front bar with sharp angles everywhere and they think, oh, that's a nightmare. But actually those are far easier than um, smooth, smooth, curvy front bars. So does anybody have any questions on, on highlights, on hiding joins? Oh, I can see that one come through. How much overlap would you suggest between two films, between the two films? That's a really good question. So. I'll show you, I'll do this again. Uh, I'll try and get this camera nice and close. So for this particular um, curve here, I would do, this, you'd almost, I almost look at the thickness of the reflection and use both sides of it. So I'd probably, uh, not every time, I often aim for the top of the reflection. Sometimes it's sort of in the middle and then the other, overlap stopping at the bottom of the reflection some cars neither of the two that i have here though some cars will have another this almost has another angle here you can see the second body line it's not <clears throat> sharp enough but i have done a couple of cars where there's sort of another angle that might be 10 or 20 mil away and i have often gone all the way to the next angle <clears throat> again just stopping using another line on the car to hide where the vinyl stops. But I'll show you what I would actually probably, actually probably, what I would do on this. <clears throat> so the bottom piece. The top of the highlight. And to anybody who's sort of um, just getting into using knifeless or not super experienced or competent with it, please make sure that you <clears throat> always get both bits of the green tape out. I have seen um, people miss the second bit of green because it does split into two. And if you leave a bit of the green tape behind there, the vinyl just basically doesn't stick down at all. So I'm now putting this piece on sort of the bottom of that highlight. I'll just go to the handheld so you can see. So this here is about a five mil overlap on this one. So I wouldn't, I generally don't wanna go less than five mil, but I do sometimes go up to 10 or more. If there is another line that lets you hide it further down, by all means, keep going. There's nothing wrong with going 20, 30 mil 
as long as it, you know, you can hide it somewhere. So then I'll just quickly put a bit of film on this. And I'll see if I can get a little bit of a color line up. Now, of course, these bits that I've that I'm working with are pre-printed and were not <clears throat> designed. <clears throat> excuse me, we're not designed for um, doing joins like this. So if you were going to be doing a real wrap on a real car, you would aim to have, you know, not have uh, crazy lines going right over the part where you're joining it. So generally on a bar like this, you would want this to be a solid color um, and avoid all these complex lines. You go to the handheld Cohen. Hopefully you guys can see it's about five mil. So there's a nice little, this part here where the blues are the same, it's pretty well hidden there. So obviously I didn't get the black super lined up. So you can see that the second, the overlap line it's far less visible. And especially if that's pointing down um, so that you don't see the side of the vinyl. And we can just see the top line there, but I am, you know, 150 mil away with this camera. And once you go back, it becomes virtually invisible. If, could you just look at uh, Daryl's question? He's asked, is there um, any time you wouldn't uh, put it fa facing downwards? Wouldn't put it <clears throat> facing downwards. Um, there is exceptions. Yeah, there's times where, <clears throat> so generally if you're doing a two piece patch or a two piece um, rear bar like this. So this being the main piece of the bar and, and the inlay, two different pieces. Generally you do the smaller piece second, um, but not, always i'm just trying to think of an example when you would do that i mean i wouldn't on a rear bar because what would happen is that the if i reverse this you end up having an edge that water can literally sit against yeah uh, and and it will sit against so in this instance no um but yes there are times where you reverse it um, i just can't think of a perfect example right now but um, that's all something that I consider ahead of time. So that's another good, that's actually raised a good point that I definitely um, put a bit of thought into these things before I start. So there's nothing worse than starting to wrap the bar and then getting to a point where you realize I can't get this in one piece. I now have to patch it. And you might not be set up. So you didn't, you didn't plan by laying knifeless first. Um, and then the, the patch or the inlay becomes an afterthought. I'd always rather be prepared for it. Um, you always get a better result when you've intended to do something from the beginning rather than sort of getting halfway and then realizing, shit, I've got to patch it. So that's another thing to consider. And then you will decide based on, based on the look of the panel, based on the directions and the angles of the curves, which way your overlap will go. Um, so a good example, actually, if, you, if anybody, uh, if everybody saw the door handle technique that I did um, last week, I put the little patch on the door handle on first so that the other piece of film overlapped that. I have seen people reverse that and that can be okay as well. Um, the patch can go on second so it seals on the other piece. So sometimes your inlay or your patch is used to hold the other film down. Um, so that's another thing to consider. <clears throat> so any other questions on the single or the regular join? Because I'm going to keep going on this and add another piece and turn this into a double layer join or a double layer inlay. So <clears throat> when I'm doing the double layer inlay, I still am using knifeless. I'm still hiding joins, but I'm hiding them in a slightly different way. So I'm gonna take off these two bits of film. And again, this is to hide the underlap or it basically eliminates the underlap. So you'll see what I mean in a second. So I'll put this piece of knifeless down and I'm actually gonna put it back up on the top here in a place that I do not normally 
want to put a join because it's too high up. I'm not on any highlight. I'm not being, I'm not hiding on the reflection, but it should make sense in a second. So this is my main piece. This is the, the bottom or the main piece of the rear bar. And that just broke because I was getting a bit rough with it. Okay, so now I have the bottom main piece of the rear bar on. And sorry, I'm going to bring this camera down. Bear with me for a second. So that piece there, let's assume is the entire rest of the rear bar. Now I have to patch this or inlay this part here. So I will do it in this order as well when I'm doing this technique, I'll do the main part first and do the inlay part second. <clears throat> so the difference here is this time when I put knifeless down, I'm not putting it as the overlap because there's another piece to go in here. I'm actually putting this piece of knifeless right on that edge. And what I do is I put half the green tape and I'll show you a close up in a second, half the green tape uh, on the film and half on the car panel so that the filament or the little bit of string runs right along the edge of the film. And I'll often go down to the edge again with my squeegee. So I'll go to the close up just so you guys get it. Hopefully that's coming through okay. So the, the string is right on the edge of the film. So you can probably already imagine what's going to happen now when I put another piece of vinyl on and pull that knife list. It's going to end up as a butt join. So there's going to be two bits of film sitting edge to edge, no overlap. So that's the next bit I'm going to put on. And this still may not make sense. You may be thinking, why would you ever do a butt join? That's just going to shrink back. Um, it's going to leave a gap and you would be correct. But this piece is going to get covered up. So the patch, the piece that you use for this underside patch, the, the bottom layer of the double layer patch or inlay, it doesn't have to have any of the same color or the same print. It just needs to be the same film with the same laminate. So you could use an off cut of white. You could use a bit from the wheel that you've cut out from the wheel well, a bit that you've cut out from the wind, you know, any, any scrap. So if you're doing this technique, save off cuts, save extra bits of film. It's just about the thickness. So now we have two bits of film that are butt joined side by side and there's no uh, underlap there. So now I'm gonna do the top piece. Now this one, I do wanna be conscious of where this join goes because this one will be visible. So now I can put the finished line on the highlight. And I'm just going to sort of wing this. So hopefully I'll get this on a nice line. And again, you would, I would test this. So rather than just land your knifeless first shot, hoping you get it right, grab an off cut of film and check, you know, check that you've got the, the positioning of the line right. Um, I'll just use a completely different piece here. So now I go to put the overlay patch on. And it's important to know that this piece I'm going to put on now is the finished piece. So I might put a bit of knifeless up here as well because I want the stop <clears throat> up there. So Cal, this, this process, essentially you're getting rid of one of those two steps in the film. Is that correct? Exactly. You're, you're eliminating the underlap. There is no underlap now, there's only an overlap. So you'll see what that looks like in a second. This is one of my favorite techniques ever, hands down. <clears throat> so now I'll go to the close up camera. So there is no join underneath. Mm. 
And what it means is that you can hide, especially if, if this was a solid color, you know, you can obviously tell that there's two bits of vinyl there because the color changes quite dramatically. But here where it's white, it's, uh, it's gets very hard to see. This is a really good technique for when you've got um, curves that are not sharp enough. So if this was, this is probably a 10 mil sort of radius curve. If that was a really big, smooth, curve there would be no nice sharp line for me to hide the hide the underlap on so i might consider doing this technique <clears throat> i gen another thing you've got to consider you are using an extra piece of film so the part that you do the double join on you want to be um small or you don't want to have to rewrap too big of an area so insides of um, rear bars or um you know, whatever this top piece is called, it escapes me. Um, these are a perfect place to do it because they're generally under the width of the film and they're only often about 100 mil or whatever. So you can save a piece of white off the... So when you put your piece, of, put your print over the bench, put it through the laminator, you're going to have a fair bit of white uh, unprinted area. Cut that off, it's, but it's got laminate on it. Cut that off and save it. And you might only have a 200 mil strip, but that might get you two or three of these, um, you know, rear bar patches. Because again, that the underside piece gets completely covered up, so it doesn't matter what that is under there, essentially. Maybe make sure, maybe check if you're going to do white over top and it's a bright color, just make sure none of the color bleeds through. But um, I think it would almost never be an issue. So does anybody have any, well, first, does anybody already do the double, double inlay. Has anybody done that before? Seen it done? Um, I'd, I'd really love to know if people are, are doing that. Lisa says yes. Excellent. And then, of course, I'd pull the second line. And these are these are tips really, Cal, just to to perfect the art, isn't it? It's not something that you mm -hmm. have to do every single time. It's exactly. Just, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, um, and that goes for everything that I show people. I don't expect that every technique gets used on every job, but I think it's valuable to have these sort of things in in your toolbox, in your arsenal, because um, if the right job comes up or you have a particularly fussy customer um, and you want to pull out all the stops, then you might go to these lengths and, and you know, hide a join you may not have otherwise hidden. If you're rushed, a good way to gauge if you should do these sort of techniques. Some people say, I don't have time. I don't have time on jobs to do that sort of thing. If that's the case, then just, then don't do it. If you don't have the time, that's a very good indicator that, you know, the, the job is not requiring this sort of a join. If you have a customer that drops the car off and says, keep it for two weeks, I don't care, I just want it perfect, then that's when you'll spend a bit of extra time and, and sort of go to that extra level. But having that, this, this technique uh, I use a lot on front bars, on um, if uh, you know the little cavities where the driving lights are on front bars, often they <clears throat> have a quite a sharp return edge. So I'll often patch those, wrap the bar, cut those out, patch them with the butt join and then patch it again. And it really helps hide joins on the front bars as well. So I use this te technique a lot. So if anybody, if people are already doing that, that's really great to hear, I'm really, Really glad to hear that. If anybody isn't, um, it's it's a really cool one to use. Is there any other questions on the double patch <clears throat> or anything on anything at all? Actually, no, at the moment, I think, uh, no questions. That's I don't know if you cover this, but <clears throat> you just said, would you do both pieces and only use one cut line to butt up? Say that again, Cohen. Lisa said, would you do both pieces and only use one cut line to butt up? 
both oh when you're doing when i'm doing the underside i think what that what she means would i <clears throat> put the piece of knifeless tape down and cut through both layers at the same time is that what you meant lisa i have if that is i have tried that before um yeah, and yes you can yes okay i have done that before with varying results um the the knifeless that i've got here is design line um which if you guys are familiar you know it's the thinner the thinner one the more conformable one there is of course fine line which is thicker and i will <clears throat> every time i talk about fine line i like to remind people not to break this stuff is obviously very easily breakable but don't try to do that with fine line i mean i have seen some people do it but i've also seen people get cut because fine line the string is far thicker uh, and it can um, cut cut into your fingers. If I had fine line, I might try this. I get nervous with design line that it's going to break once once you get two layers of film. <clears throat> Let's just try it. I'll put a piece down and we'll see what happens. Generally, I find it doesn't give as good of a finish. It's sort of I tend to get a little bit of um, too much vinyl, a little bit a little bit of excess. And it does mean that you have to peel out one layer from underneath. Let's see how this works. Okay, design line cut through that, no problems at all. So now peel the top off of that piece. Then I do need to lift this piece up Peel the bottom piece out, and I'll see if I can do this. And then a good tip is to <clears throat> just put a little bit of heat on to let any any of that stretch. Well, if it did stretch, let that relax. And yeah, so I haven't. You know, I didn't take too much care when doing that, but I'll show you. And I might've been able to pull the knifeless on another angle. You can go to the handheld, Cohen. There's, there is a little lip there. So I may have, I may have accidentally done that, but the, it, it isn't perfectly flush at the moment. Um, so that's what I've experienced in the past that it, because when it pulls, it does sort of lift the vinyl ever so slightly and you just get a little bit of extra distance. Um, but I might have been able to offset that by <clears throat> pulling, pulling the knifeless line. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, pulling the, the line on an angle away. So the direction, generally I pull it at a 90 degree you know, an angle straight up from the car, but I could have potentially tried to pull it on a bit of an angle that may have offset that little quarter of a mil or whatever that little lip is, but you can hear it's not flush. So if you can do it with one piece and it works, then excellent, um, go for it. I just find it's a little bit risky and it's, I just find it safer to do it, to do it in two pieces. Hopefully that answers uh, Lisa's question. Yeah, I think so, Carl. Yes, and then there's, a, there's a question regarding those spotlights and how to use uh, knifeless tape in circles. I don't know if you were going to talk about that today or if that's, if that's a, a topic for- Say, that, say uh, that again, so using knifeless tape. Yeah, so how to inlay those spotlight recesses. Oh, yeah. Um, and how to use, uh, you know, do you use knifeless tape in a circle? Yes, I to, do. For so <laughs> I'll- um, <coughs> I'll close the boot here and just get a bit more of a working space. Um, I'll, now this is not really going to be. <clears throat> you know, this is not a, a light, a driving light, <clears throat> um, but it's just a flat piece. So you've got to sort of use your imagination here, but. Excuse me, of course I go <clears throat> horse when I'm doing a webinar. 
So I think what you're asking, and this is a, has always been a challenge that I've come across, is when you have to wrap the knifeless right around on itself and then still start it. So it's all good and well if you've got um, two sides, you've got a starting point and an end point off to the off to the sides. But when you do a circle, you have to overlap the film, uh, the, the knifeless. So that it really depends on if the patch is the uh, inside piece or if it's the outside piece as to which way the the tail of the, the knifeless goes. So sometimes you can leave the edges off and outside. Other times they have to be inside. Um, now, whoever asked that, can, they, can you just comment, is this the sort of thing that you were referring to when the knifeless um, has to do that sort of thing? So if this was, and I've, I've had to do this quite recently, this is the, um, pretend there's a driving light in here. <clears throat> when I lay the last piece of the film down, I'll bring it inwards and stick it onto the light itself. And I'll generally try to leave an area of the light uh, without tape on it. I know it's, it's a good practice to tape up things so that the vinyl doesn't stick to them as, as much. But if you do put masking tape over your driving light, then the knifeless doesn't want to stick to the masking tape. So often I'll leave a section um, untaped, stick the knifeless directly to the glass or the plastic of the driving light, and then I'll put masking tape over top to create that non-stick area for when I'm, um, when I'm actually wrapping it. There, and it is, this is fiddly to start these sort of things. There's no two ways about it, but then once you start and pull your line, you do have to be careful that when you come around to the other side, before finishing, I wanna get that first bit of tape and vinyl out the way, and then pull the rest of the line. Hopefully that's what that question was asking about. But yes, you do have to, yeah. Somewhere the, the, the knifeless has to overlap if you're doing a full circle. And generally I'll do it up under. So if the driving light is here, I'll do it, I'll put the overlap or the crisscross of the knifeless underneath. Um, sometimes it can be on a bit of an angle depending on where it's gonna be most hidden or out, out, of, out of the way. But I'm sure everybody who's used this, used knifeless has got themselves sort of uh, into a tricky situation where the knifeless is sort of hard to reach or it's sort of on a return edge and you can't really get your hand in there and it pops off the panel. <clears throat> These are all real challenges, <clears throat> excuse me, and things that I have to deal with as well. So there's, yeah, there's always going to be um, tricky times with knifeless. That, that crucial part, as you said, Cal, to start with a moment of reflection before you drop right into it. Say that again, Neil, sorry. I was well, st starting to plan before you, uh, before you put any vinyl anywhere near the yes, vehicle. Yes, exactly. So the more planning you put in, the better. Um, yeah, there's nothing worse than getting, doing a front bar, front bumper, getting to the driving light, thinking that you're going to wrap it in one go, realizing that you can't, and then trying to put knifeless in behind. Or the alternative, the thing that people generally do is you have to pull out the knife and do a cut, a hand cut, instead of using the knifeless, which I know, you know, I generally feel confident, confident doing, and I know a lot of people do, but if, if I can, I use knifeless um, instead of doing a hand cut, just as a good practice. Because even if you've done it a million times, you can always just make that one mistake and cut a little bit too deep. It can happen to anyone. So, Good practices to use knifeless where you, where possible. So, does anybody have any other questions on on knifeless or or joins or anything like that? No. That's so far, so good, Cal. So far, so good. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to. 
move on then to <clears throat> the now you might just want to um hold the fort for a minute neil while i'm, I'm gonna have to adjust the tripod and i'm gonna move the camera up to the roof of the car and we'll do some templating on the aerial so in the questions uh just in case the worst comes to the worst and uh, auckland still still in lockdown for a while um type in the question bar what would you like to see next what's the uh, Ooh, next topic absolutely. if we if we were to run another uh callum session um doesn't necessarily be, need to be vehicle wraps is there anything you'd like to learn about windows floors glass uh, walls you, you name it the the, the topics are, are open i'd like freedom um we'll do our very best to that caller i'm not sure who that is <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, we're definitely that we're here. We're here to help. Um, we're here to uh, give share Callum's words of wisdom and advice. Um, but also, you know, again, ha actually, back in the tip bar, is there anything that Cal did there that you would do differently that you think we might be able to improve on? And I know that's one of Cal's mantras: is he he never stops learning, and um, he's always willing to take uh, advice from other people and try a different tip and trick as well. So Absolutely. If there's any anything there as well. So I'm just going to grab yeah. a second tripod. <clears throat> yeah. Anything? Anybody else got any anything that they would like us to cover next time? Ah, tips on remove removing uh, parts of the car color. That might be uh, one that your uh, your wife might not like uh, taking a vehicle apart on the drive. But <laughs> uh, yeah, um, tips on removing parts of cars. Um, Get, get yourself those, the, the pry tools. So the, um, we've got sort of super cheap auto over here. I think Repco, I'm not sure what you've got in New Zealand, but you can buy, in fact, I think computer let us sell them. And um, someone might be able to confirm that for me. Uh, if you've got those plastic pry tools, definitely use them. Um, you know, experience is, is the main thing. Once you've done those things a few times, one really good tip is if you've, if you've always got the same cars coming up, um, and we had this at Exotic Graphics where we had a bunch of Renault vans, and we always broke the clips taking off um, the side, the big side bits of plastic, for whatever reason, um, they, just, they just wanted to break. They're not made to come off. So what we did was we would, we found somewhere that we could order those, and we just bought hundreds, you know, bags of hundreds of these clips um, from an auto parts place. <clears throat> and so that when we had these Renaults in, we didn't need to worry about breaking the clips. We basically just pulled them off quickly. Most of the clips broke, but you just swap them out, put brand new clips in. So the panel just goes back on perfectly. <clears throat> so uh, you might be thinking about things like mirrors and door handles as well, where there's not clips, um, there's just screws and bolts, those things can't give you there's just so many variations but just take care be careful um, if you're pulling off door trims uh, that may be considered too much work for a lot of people and I would understand that but other I do know plenty of shops that will take out door trims take out windows uh, to get to door handles obviously just make sure that you guys are everybody's comfortable and, and qualified to be doing that level of work um, so future future uh, topics, Cal, uh, yes. wrapping wrapping mirrors, and um, so I think that would be something that we could easily easily attempt in a in a future event. Yep. Yep. Wrapping mirrors. All right. I've just realised I was going to go high with the tripod, but I'm going to go low and put the tripod on the roof okay. to get a better view. So bear with me. So I saw someone said wrapping mirrors <clears throat> as a topic for next time. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that we can do. Okay. <clears throat> now, hopefully. And I asked maybe as a, a question while you're setting up, can people yeah. give a, a, a percentage in their, you know, is it 50-50 color change versus digital wrap? Is it 70-80? What can I ask everybody to just sort of like put a, a split? What, good what question. Doing? Yes, that's a really good point because we obviously at the moment are only covering 
digital print, but it is always good to know. Okay, I think we're nearly ready here. Obviously, those tips on hiding the um, <laughs> the, jo the joins and the, the double layer inlays, Cal, they're, they're all yeah. they're, they're relevant to both parts of those applications. Absolutely, yeah. So pretty much everything that we're covering here, you know, is uh, translates across color change and digital. And in fact, generally everything gets easier with color change um, because you don't have, well, partly the, the film's not as thick and you don't have different colors in the print to worry about. So if you're just doing gloss black, uh, overlaying onto gloss black, then of course it's going to be pretty easy to, you don't have to worry about any lineup. Yeah. Okay, so can everybody see the little aerial piece on the roof here of the Yaris? So I've taken, I've taken the aerial out. Um, it conveniently unscrews. I know some either don't come out or they're a lot more aggressive than this. They might be the shark fin style of aerial. You know, there's a lot of different variations, but if you've got something like this, um, and, and the technique stays the same, so I'll do this no matter what the shape. So I start with a bit of paper, just a bit of A4 paper, and this is going to be uh, what I use to create the first shape. Um, some people use masking tape, and if you do that and it works to get your template, to get your shape, then keep doing that but this is my preferred technique. So I'll start by marking the, the width of the aerial that way. And that's to give me the width down here. And then I'll get the length of it. And I'm going larger. So I want this cut out to give me a nice uh, gap around the edge. So one that I've prepared earlier, doesn't need to be a huge gap around the edge, it just needs to be a gap, just not quite touching. So then I'm going to tape this on to the car because I don't want this to move. So the next part is to actually trace it. Now I'm going to use a little spacer tool here. Um, this is a little vinyl uh, removing tool. You can use anything that you want. I do recommend that it's something square, nice straight edges, um, but you can make a piece. Like, so if you've got a guillotine or you've got a, a panel slitter or something, you can use a piece of ACM composite panel. You can use a piece of color bond, um, whatever. Make sure the edges aren't too sharp, but anything. Just don't, if you make something, don't lose it because you're gonna need to use it again and again. I use these because if I lose it, I can just buy another one. So this spacer is going to trace the shape of this, but out here. So I'm gonna butt it against the edge and I'm gonna draw a line on the other side. And if anybody was in, in Hamilton, I know I reference this all the time now. If anybody did catch me when I was over in New Zealand briefly, I think I did this, oh, I did do this over there. So you might have already seen this technique, but I love, doing this and this is the only way that I trace these now. So just go around, draw lines sort of every five mil. You can do this as close together as you like or you can kind of rush it and go faster. But the more lines you do, the better it will uh, trace the shape. So another thing I wanna do, well, Another thing that's a good idea to do, just to visually mark center. Uh, this doesn't have to be perfect, but it's a good idea to just sort of get a rough center so that you know once you take this off, uh, which what its orientation is. Another really good tip is to measure from here, from, from anywhere to the edge of the, the panel. So I'm gonna hook the tape measure on the, on the edge of the roof and here's 100 mil. So I'm gonna mark 100 and draw that as a note on there. So I know 
the positioning of this relative to the, the roof. And I'll do the same at the front. So let's just make up a number, 1600 to the front. I'll tell you why that measurement is also is important later as well. So then I've got this. Now I can take this off. Did everybody see that part okay while I was doing that? Now, you've got to bear with me a sec. I am going to bring the camera back down and move back to my mobile workbench momentarily. This is why I need a film crew. You can have one when you're out of lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, switching hopefully back. Okay, so we're back in my little uh, workbench. All right, one more adjustment. Okay. So we have the templated piece of paper over here. So this is, oh, and I would also want to write on this, Toyota Yaris, because uh, these can be saved and used later. Uh, there's a few different ways that you can, you can do this, but I'll, I'll show you the, the first part of the, the manual way to do this. And then I'll talk about actually scanning this in as well and saving it on file. So let's just say this part of vinyl, piece of vinyl here is gonna be my entire roof. Uh, just use your imagination. So this is going to lay this on the bench, which is this tiny piece of MDF that I have here. And then stick the template onto it and get it locked into position. So this is where these measurements come in handy because I need to know that this piece here is 100 mil from the edge of the film. So I would need to move this. If I pre-cut my roof, which a lot of people do, lay your pre-cut roof piece on the bench and measure it so, well, 100 million is, is getting it flush to the edge of the bench. Take this down. So you would obviously bring it in 150 mil or whatever you would want so that you've got 100 mil to the edge plus bleed. So then all you do is redraw that shape but on the inside. So you, this is where it's important to have kept this tool or kept this, this jig, this guide. So draw, but the guide up to the line that you drew and draw a line on the other side. So in this instance, I'm doing this on the backing paper. And of course I've picked a pen that the ink is gonna smudge. Should have got a ballpoint, that's okay. So as you go around and mark this line, the shape starts to reveal itself on the inside. And of course it's slightly angular, but I find it is very, very accurate. Now, is anybody, as you're seeing me do this, is, it, is anybody already using this technique or what's, or what is everybody's sort of go-to technique with doing templates? So I've got this shape traced on the inside now. I'm in position. I can now take this part off. I'm going to save that for now. And now I have the shape of the aerial, the rough shape of the aerial. I will often go around and draw this again and just sort of smooth out any, you know, average out any of those little corners. You can go to, go to whatever length you want to go to there. Then I'm going to cut it out. Now for this one, I'm going to go inside I want there to be a little bit of a little bit of an overlap so I'm going to bring the knife a couple mil inside if you want uh, to go short which I have done in the past say if it's a black roof 
which as we all know, black cars are the best color to wrap. If it's black and it needs a print on the roof, but it's a promo or it's a, you know, you don't need to be tucking under rubbers, then you might actually cut on the outside of this and just give yourself a five mil gap around the aerial. And if you do that nicely, it looks fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, per, you need to gauge if that job's appropriate. So if it's a color change or it's a high-end wrap, you're gonna need to, well, you're probably gonna to wanna to tuck under the rubber. So you cut slightly inside. So I'm just gonna go around and hand cut this. Yeah. Now, I'll just keep talking a bit about this before moving the, the camera up and down over and over again. So there you can see, I've cut just inside, two, two mil inside, and I now have the shape of my aerial on the cut into this. So I would then go up and check this, which I'll do in a minute, but if I'm happy with this, let's say I've nailed this, it's perfect. Um, and I want to keep this because I say, for instance, I know I've got 15 Yaris's coming up. And if this is a really good time to stress, if you've got a fleet of anything, it doesn't even matter what you're doing, there's almost always going to be some sort of time saving um, thing that you can do with templating. If you've just got a one off car or you're always only doing one offs, I can understand maybe templating isn't time effective effort that you go to um, and I can understand that but if you have repeat jobs I highly recommend you do stuff like this um, spend a bit of extra time because you will save time in the long run so this is a perfect example of this is literally a, a real life example of something that we did back at exotic graphics we and it was generally my task to do this if a car came in we did a lot of jeep uh, uh, the Black Hawk ones with the shark fin aerial. And we had a lot of just roof wraps coming in and we got sick of pre-measuring, uh, you know, measuring out the piece every time, pulling it out on the bench. So we actually did the entire roof as a cut file. So we had our little, so we did this, did our trace. I scanned it in. I had my marks of 200 mil from there and I had, 1.7 meters to the front. I then scanned this in and I put, generally I'll put a bit of black paper down to get that contrast because otherwise it'll just be white on white or you could scan it the other way depending on the color of your vinyl. Scan that in, hopefully you've got a flatbed. Almost every person that's got a printer these days has a scanner. If you don't, they're pretty cheap to, to buy. Then import that into Illustrator or whatever your preferred um, vector software is and trace that shape. You can do a, you know, there's a few different ways you can do that with a live trace or I, I use the pen tool and just drop nodes and pull to get the curves nice. Um, once you have traced that shape, you now have a cut file of your aerial. That's, that's all good and well to just have the shape cut out, but where, how does that actually Help you when you're doing a roof wrap. Well, what we used to do was create a file. So we knew that the, air, that the roof was 1700 that way by 200 that way. So we might have a box that was 2100. Now I'm just going to go up to my whiteboard here. Uh, might have been 2100 this way, let's say, and by the width of the material, but allowing for a bit of bleed. And I knew from having my measurements that I went in 200 mil and then put the aerial there. And then whatever that distance was, say it was 1700. So we would set this up with a box in Illustrator, but often we would not want the sides there as a box because on some roofs, depending on the width of your material, some roofs you want every available um, bit of material to hold onto. So putting lines down the side for the plotter to cut isn't always practical. So how we would get around that is we'd just make little boxes. You could just do a singular cut line, 
but I found a box is much better. It's much easier to see. Um, so you just cut two little boxes, which are five mil by the width, by the widest width that you can cut. And then once they came out of the plotter, you'd have a bit of material on either side. And then you would just weed those out and manually just with your knife cut to the edge. And then, or you'd cut right through. So then you have a Jeep or in, you know, whatever the vehicle is, a Jeep roof that you can send through your plotter. The plotter then measures it for you as well. So that's another thing. You don't need to go to your roll of vinyl on the wall, pull it off, get someone else to hold the tape measure, drops on the floor, picks up dust, all that sort of stuff. You just load the material into the plotter, hit cut, and you've cut yourself a Jeep roof or a Toyota Yaris roof with the aerial already cut out. Then when you go to, and another cool thing that you can do is you might, and I definitely go to these lengths because I get a bit carried away sometimes. If you know that your windscreen, so generally cars are wider at the front, often the roof will sort of have a bit of a taper. You might know that your windscreen is, starts 50 mil in from the edge, so when you do these little cuts, you can put little divots or um, markers. You can put little V for a center line, whatever you want to do. So that when it cuts it, it cuts that shape out. Then you go to put the piece on the roof and you know you've got your center point. You align that to the, you know, the, the mirror on the inside of the windscreen or align these sides to the, to the trim on the roof, whatever. Um, the back, you need very little alignment because that can't go anywhere else. That obviously locks onto the aerial. So then it's just a case of, um, and it, generally I'd get an extra person to help, but I have done plenty of roofs on my own as well. You then, you can either cut right through the backing as well so that the piece will fit onto the roof, or if you're confident, you can just peel the backing off, um, hook the part on to the aerial and start wrapping. Does that make sense to everyone? Has it, is everybody, or sorry, is anybody already um, scanning templates in? Is anybody pre, you know, cutting panels like this on their plotter? Or is everybody, is everybody pulling the rolls off the wall, manually cutting, that sort of thing? I'd love to know if people are doing that. No, but we will. Excellent. I love this. It's, <laughs> again, you know, People say, oh, I don't have time to template. Why would you template? I can hand cut around a, an aerial pretty quickly. And if you can, that's great. But again, if you've got 10, 20, 30 of these and you're manually doing it every time, um, I, can, I can assure you that from real experience that these do save time. You'll never get, once you've got the measurement as well, it doesn't change. So, and hopefully you'll get to a point where you have folders on your computer of pre, um, pre-measured, pre-scanned templates. So, you know, we, we did have a Jeep folder. We had handle cutouts. Um, so a good example is if you, no pre-cutting. So yeah, I, I highly recommend this. You know, a car would come in and we'd go, okay, that's a whatever model Jeep. Look on the computer, open up the folder, see what we've got in there. Um, and if we had, you know, if someone came in and said, we've got a roof wrap, we knew, oh, I just want a black roof. We knew, great, easy, we've got the piece. Uh, if they wanted something else, hopefully if you've, got, if you've got a few templates, you might have a piece in there. And if you do, uh, it'll save you some time. Uh, another thing we did, we had a lot of the uh, Toyota Hiluxes to do, but they were fast, basically just, you know, promo style wraps, door handles stayed in. So we templated, did this exact same technique. And I do have a video on this, um, which we can maybe share the link to. Um, but I believe it's on YouTube. Neil, you might remember. Um, I did a door handle video on how to, how to trace around door handles. And basically, it looked very similar to this, except so the two parts of the handle that actually join the car are there and there. And so my you know, I did the trace and scanned around two bits like that. And then I had to allow for a center cut so that the vinyl went on. And what we actually did, once you get that trace really accurate, 
you can also trace the door cup. So we had templates. Give my. We had templates that looked like that. That was the door handle plus the door cup, because that was that was the finish that they were happy with, and we ended up having whole sides of Hiluxes that would come off the plotter because we had our two door handles and we measured, that is a terrible drawing. I'm normally actually not bad at drawing, but that is awful. We'd, we'd have our two door handles, you'd have the measurement, you'd know that they were X apart and you'd know that they were how high, whatever they were off the bottom and the top, you work that all out ahead of time. And again, you know where the stop points are. So we would just do a little box at the front and the back and a nearly three or nearly four meter piece of film would go through the plotter, cut the endpoints and cut the handles out. And I can tell you they were some of the fastest um, sides of Hiluxes we had ever wrapped because just two guys peel the backing and the, the door handles tell you exactly where the piece has to go. And the film lays flat, it doesn't bunch up. And we were, you know, we had those panels on in sort of half an hour. Um, so another really good example of when the plotter um, can save you a lot of time. Now I know not everybody's gonna be doing door handles where you cut around the door cup. So that is a specific example on a sort of lower end job, but um, absolutely worth its weight in gold doing that. Um, someone's asked about stretch. Really good, uh, really, really good question. Um, and I actually meant to say that and forgot. So thank you. On these, and I'm thinking, I think this is what you're referring to, the stretch um, between the door handles. So I would, did make this measurement a few mils smaller. So say if I measure the, um, the tape measure butted on the edge of each door handle and it was, say it was one meter, I would make that 950 six or something like that. I, and there is a little bit of trial and error, uh, but I believe from memory it was about three or four millimeters. And then, you know, but check your film, depending on what film you use, you know, SLX plus gets very little stretch. It has such a nice release value from the backing paper. Other films will stretch significantly just from peeling the backing paper. So don't just pick a number and use it across all films. You will do want to check. But another thing to consider is it's easier to stretch the film than it is to, to shrink it. So if you do compress that distance by a few mil, you can obviously pull on it a little bit to get it into line, much easier than you can, the well, it's virtually impossible to, to shrink it. So hopefully that answers that question. But yes, that is a really, really good question. Uh, and obviously on a roof, it doesn't matter. It only matters if you've got two cutouts. So, there were definitely times that we did half of this, so we didn't have the second handle because the print might have come down like this and ended at the front wheel well or whatever. So, but still, um, oh, great, thanks, Neil. So there's a link there to the, the door handle templating technique. So, and again, I do stress, there's a time and a place for this, these techniques. And a lot of, I got a lot of sort of questions, people going, why would you go? And if you do watch that door handle technique, why would you go to so much effort? Just take the handle out. Um, and I agree, if you can take the handle out, that's great. But there are always gonna be a, a few jobs that crop up that for whatever reason, you either don't have time to take the handle out, the client may have uh, specifically requested that you don't remove hardware. It may be a lease vehicle. They don't wanna take the risk of anything, um, you know, not being OEM anymore. Um, there's, a, there's a vast array of reasons why um, you might not be able to take a handle out. Um, and in that video, you will see a different technique where I don't go around the door cup, but I do actually add a patch in. So the two shapes of the handle get cut out and there is, a, has to be a join there. And then I do add a little patch in because invariably the two bits of vinyl don't meet back up when they wrap into the door cup. So if you watch that video, all will be explained there. So is there any other, any questions on anything that we've 
done so far, but anything about templating? And I'll just show you while we, uh, I'll, I won't move the tripod for this Cohen, I'll just switch to the handheld. But I'll just show you whilst I was doing that. Yeah. The the link that I put there will take you to the YouTube channel. It's actually Arlon's YouTube channel, Wrap It Right. Um, there's obviously some other training videos there that Cal shot, some some from our US team and our European team as well. So there might be some interesting stuff there if you're still in lockdown in a few days' time and you're missing missing your dose of Arlon, then you know visit visit that. I'm sure you'll find a few. If you're missing cows, dulcet tones, you can log on there as well. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, there's some good content on there. So I'll just show you, I won't wrap this fully because I haven't actually even cleaned this properly. Another good reminder, always clean thoroughly. Cleaning is the most important step. So you can see here, it fits nicely over the shape, but it's a little bit snug, which I wanted that was on purpose. So I, can you know that allows me to then tuck under that little rubber there but you know you can see from that very rough template and it was rough i would normally have spent a bit more time it gets the shape uh very very accurately and it means that the vinyl doesn't tent over that high point you know if you've seen if you don't cut out the aerial first it bunches up and you'll get wrinkle lines um, spanning out from the aerial. Um, there's something just so nice about the film sitting flat and sitting, you know, directly on the panel. Just makes for such an easier install. So, was there any other questions that came through that weren't sort of on topic and that we want to address now? So, I've basically covered all the techniques that I wanted to cover. Um, actually, I do have one more tip one more trick that i'll show you so this wasn't on the um on the on the list but it's enough it's just happy to be can't wait to try that from lisa excellent so you're currently not doing that technique i love when i hear that people are gonna use the things that i've shown i always um get a kick out of that I'd, and, and again and Lisa, if, uh, if you do if you do try it then you know give try shoot a little video and flick it back to cal so uh you know absolutely I'm sure you see, see the fun in that now i'll just open up grab my knife here just going to show you a little technique now if anybody's hopefully you can see this part of the panel here so if you go go into the regular tripod camera so this bit here is something, is an area where when you're wrapping the back of the car or any part where it joins the glass and you, hopefully you can see, this is one of those sort of live edge floating windows. Obviously these are getting more and more common on older cars. Uh, there might be a big black plastic or rubber um, trim, but a lot of these cars are now having this sort of floating edge and the, the silicon or the foam glue weld part is, is tucked behind and it can create quite a big drop in there and I see a lot of people's film stopping short so I'm just going to show you a couple little tricks on that so the first thing um, I'll show you is just with a bit of masking tape so if I just lay the tape directly over the glass completely flat, not trying to lay any of it in and trim it. This is sort of a very, very quick way of checking where your film is going to land. So you can see there, hopefully that focuses. You can see there that the film drops in and hopefully it shows up. At the angle I'm sitting, I can see almost five mil of panel back there. Now, on a car of this color, it's Kind of a dark charcoal it's not black but uh, i would almost be happy with that for you know 80 90 percent of wraps because it's a dark color if it was a red car as you know or a horrible bright color um leaving bits of body color showing is not always acceptable 
So what I do in those instances is get a piece of film. And it, again, I'm, I'm using offcuts for a lot of this, for a lot of testing. So I'll cut a few strips and I basically just experiment with how much extra vinyl I need to give it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tape the, the um, windscreen or the window so that the vinyl doesn't stick to this. And I'm gonna lay a piece of film over it. And I'm just going to wing this one and just try adding five mil. I'm just gonna do a cut there. Hopefully that's not too bright reflection. So that's coming through okay. So you can see the film there. Now I pop that back up off the uh, tape. And then with my squeegee, feed that under. And I'm actually really happy with that, with that distance. So that was an extra five mil, let's just say. So now I know that's how much extra I wanna add. So when I go to actually wrap the, the rear panel, I'll run tape right across the, the edge and I'll, you know, I know that it's five mil, so I'm happy to sort of visualize that. But if, if you want a, a sort of little reminder, you can sort of tick out where you want that to be. And then when you go to do, so you could either then put knifeless tape along that edge and I know I actually talked about knife that's not sticking to masking tape. So maybe you would skip the, skip the masking tape and just put the knife directly on the glass. That would be okay. Um, run your knife right along that edge or use tape and hand cut it. So when you wrap your panel, just do your hand cut five mil over, pop it back off, off the glass and then do your uh, tucking to get the film nicely under the under the glass. Is everybody, is anybody already doing that sort of thing? Or is anybody sort of, I'm sure we can all have a story of when we've done a panel, thought we've nailed it. I definitely have done this. Um, felt really good about it and then done the last little bit, tucked the vinyl and then realized that that return edge just went a bit further than I realized. And there's this sort of really uh, obvious bit of body color showing through, which is just really annoying. And then I've, you know, in the past had to, yep, someone says use, actually use knife tape on the glass. Perfect, perfect. So that's, that's probably actually the best way. So I definitely have done this where I've hand cut sometimes, but um, knife you know, even safer. And there have been times where I've had to sort of patch in a bit of extra print material and there's nothing worse than trying to get, you know, it's very easy to tuck film in when it's all connected, but it's very hard to get a strip of five mil of film in and behind there as an afterthought. So again, it all comes back to sort of planning ahead of time, thinking about what, you know, not rushing in is basically um, a good lesson. Step back, think about what might, uh, go wrong or what what you might come up against and then uh, plan for it. But that's just a nice little nice little uh, trick that I use that I didn't for a long time and I don't know why it's one of those ones that when I got shown it I was like oh of course that makes so much sense uh, but prior to that I sort of just struggled with you know I might have tried to roll the film in another technique you can do rather than cutting excess is just to basically feed in as much as you can beforehand. And there's nothing, if you can get this well done, if you can do this well every time, there's nothing wrong with doing this. Roll that in and then still cut against the glass. So you, it's basically achieving the same thing, but just through a different way. Instead of having the excess up on the glass, you just have it bent, folded inwards. But even there, you know, I definitely didn't get that one as far. So that would again be another trial and error thing. Experiment with how much you need to feed the film in. But I generally 
yeah, roll in and trim. And you'll know through experience, some windows just need a gentle roll and a trim and that's fine. Um, others, you know, uh, there's the side windows on, might be eye loads when they have the, the glass panel in, or you, I'm sure you can picture there's a couple of vans that have those rear side windows that open up um, and they go in, you know, 20, 30 mil of this big curvy bit of panel right behind the glass. Um, they're a whole nother challenge in themselves. But that's a good example of where you want to really get the film in and behind the glass, if you can. So that pretty much, um, that covers all the actual demos and all the um, parts that I wanted to cover. And how long have we gone? An hour and a half, and we've got good good amount of people here. So we can open open this up to questions now. Um, I know you've been asking as we go, but feel free to ask me anything you want while you've got me here. It doesn't have to be related to the techniques we've done. Welcome to ask um, about the wrap like a king cars. We did at exotic graphics. If you want, happy to talk about that and anything else. Neil, did you want to? Well, no, I was just saying, yeah, do, do, let's make it a, uh, you know, a session where they can just ask, or anybody can ask you anything, Cal. So, what, Cal, maybe I'll kick it off. What yeah. do you think the most valuable thing that you've learned as a rapper has been? It doesn't have to be one thing. It could Ooh. be something in general terms. That's... What's, what's, made, what's made you where you are today? Um... It probably would be the uh, not preparation, but just the the thinking that goes into rapping before I start. I think is the main thing. So, and I, I do say this: if anybody um, has has met me and I've, I've been able to do any live training with you, I always say to people: just pause before you start. Pause for a little bit longer than you normally would. Um, if it's, if it's a car that you've not um, wrapped before. So obviously if it's something that you've done a million times, just jump into it. But the, a common thing I see people do is they'll pull the backing off, put film on and just work it out as they go. There's nothing wrong with doing that. And that is a great way to learn. But as, as I've gone on, I have, um, I stopped for longer and I look at the panel and I visualize what the vinyl is gonna do. So, um, if there's a convex curve and a concave curve, you know, and if you saw last week, I talked about um, build up of vinyl and how to help wrap corners by sending the vinyl, you know, intentionally moving your squeegee strokes um, to send vinyl towards an area. Those are the things I think about before I even start. I'll look at it and go, I'm going to need extra vinyl for this part because it dips in but I'm gonna to wanna to pull the vinyl away from that part because that's a sharp uh, convex curve. So I don't wanna just start wrapping and work it, work out when I get to it. I wanna have thought about that ahead of time. And it might be a case of putting stretch in a part of the panel that you normally wouldn't. And you might start, you don't even put the vinyl on until you've heated it and stretched it so that it's preloaded with stretch and it might not be needed until you get to the edge of the panel and then you start shrinking that vinyl and that pre-stretch that you put in now absorbs build up from a different part of the panel. So that's probably, I know that's a long-winded answer, Neil, but that's, you know, just, just thinking about things. Um, uh, you, kind of, you kind of went where I exactly thought you were gonna go, Cal, because every time I see you talk about a vehicle or you, you know, you ask somebody how you might wrap that. You know, I'd say a good majority of people would just start talking, whereas I know you do maybe five minutes of good thinking before you even uh, put put your put your tongue in gear. So, yeah, I think yeah. that's uh, that, that's the thing that I've learned from you, Cal. Just seeing when you when you approach a product or a, sorry, a, a process or a vehicle is very much good amount of time thinking about it first. Yeah, yeah. and that. You know, it, it does trans translate specifically into techniques as well. So my corner technique um, is you start thinking about the corner at least 100 mil away or 200 mil away. Um, 
And the common mistake people make is that they wrap right up to the edge, get right to the corner, and then they stretch and put all the stretch right on the corner. Um, and then the part that you're trying to wrap is, has all the, the stress and all the stretch focus right on that corner. So again, I, I start the stretch well away from the corner and, and so that when I get to the corner, I've already done the work, if that makes sense. So yeah, that, that it's, it's one thing to say it, it's, a, it's much harder to know that intuitively. So practice and experience is everything. But, you know, I am, that's what I'm here for is, is to support you guys. So, you know, if you've got a project coming up or you've got a car in your shop and you're thinking, I'm not sure how I'm gonna tackle this, reach out to me, reach out to us. I'd be happy to help, I'd love to help. So, um, you can get me, oh, cal.arlon. You can get me on Instagram. Uh, also follow Arlon Graphics underscore ANZ. Um, that's a really great way to keep in, keep up with um, things that we're doing and, and, and you can message us on there as well. And, and if you've done any great work using an Arlon product, feel free to share it with us. We'll repost it, you know, then, you'll, then your business gets some global, uh, global reach as well. Everybody loves a bit of recognition. So there's that. So, yeah, let's, um, let, let's please keep in contact with the computer letter. We will be doing another session if, uh, if lockdown continues. Cal is always available to you via computer letter or directly via email. Um, you know, don't don't be backwards at coming forwards. We're here to help. You guys are what make the uh, the business the, the industry tick. Um, and we're here to support you. Well said. Yeah. All so right. We don't well, have any more questions, Cal. Um, so I think uh, if uh, if everybody's cool with that, we might. Uh, I don't want to use that word. Wrap it here, but um, <laughs> yeah. If there's if there's anything uh, else, we'll we'll sign off for this week. We'll let uh, we'll be speaking with Computer Letter, and we'll be setting up a date in uh, maybe two weeks' time. Um, uh, we can't do next Friday, but uh, we'll certainly try and do one in two weeks' time if that if that works for everybody. Excellent. Last words. Look for you, forward Ken. to it. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. It's, if anybody's been to all three, thanks for keeping on coming back. Uh, if anybody's new, do go and check those check those other ones out. And yeah, hope to see you all again. Take care. Have a great weekend.